Good afternoon and welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of your Friday with us. And this is an enormous show. We have two, two of the biggest names in plant-based medicine here with us today to share some wit, some wisdom, some knowledge, and a whole lot about nutrition. Dr. Neil Barnard is here with us today. Dr. Barnard, looking forward to catching up with you. I know you had a big day yesterday. Thank you, Chuck. And out now with a brand new book, ebook, audio book, the paperback coming very soon. Dr. Michael Greger is here. How to Survive a Pandemic is the new book. Can't wait to dive into that with you, sir. Can't wait to talk about it. All right, man. We got a lot to talk about. And you who is watching right now, get your questions ready. Matter of fact, get them ready and then put them right in the comment box because Drs. Barnard, Dr. Greger, they're going to be answering as many of your questions as possible by the end of the show. So go ahead and start posting those questions right now. But first, before we get into anything else, a quick check on health headlines for Friday, June 5th, 2020. Lockdowns as a result of the coronavirus pandemic appear to be worsening the childhood obesity epidemic. The toll from staying at home? Well, it's a dramatic increase in the consumption of red meat, sugary drinks, and junk food. Researchers say of the 41 kids they examined in Verona, Italy, the majority of them were spending an average of five hours or more greater in front of their computers, their TV screens, and they're also eating a fourth meal every single day. So more on this later in the show. But as thousands continue to flood the streets as to protest racial injustice, one of the nation's top health officials is urging demonstrators to do it safely. CDC Director Robert Redfield is floating the idea that demonstrators in areas that are still considered hotspots for the coronavirus consider being tested. He says the large groups may create so-called seating events for the virus, but he is not encouraging protesters to remain at home. So the question then becomes, how do protesters stay safe and minimize the spread? For that, let's turn to Dr. Neil Barnard. And because Dr. Barnard, I understand that you and a few of our colleagues spent part of yesterday out in the demonstrations here in Washington, D.C. So first of all, how was it? Well, I have to say it was a great experience. I have to, it, to see so many people turning out uh, for a good cause was really wonderful. The protests started uh, just about a block from our office and then ran straight down Wisconsin Avenue. For those of you who are familiar uh, with the area, um, we went from Friendship Heights down to the National Cathedral. And uh, along the way, there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And we uh, started out uh, handing out bananas and handing out uh, water bottles and masks and everything to, to the group um, and had uh, just lots of great interactions with people who are concerned not just about the issues related to uh, police uh, barbarity, really, but also related to underlying health conditions that are affecting so many people. Um, but you asked about how, how to demonstrate safely. Um, the, the thing not to do is to stay home. Uh, obviously, people do need to get out if they want to be able to express themselves in this way. Um, but uh, at the event yesterday and at all of these events, mask wearing is universal. Um, that doesn't completely eliminate transmission, but it reduces it substantially. Um, also, social distancing plays a key role, and to the extent that people can, when they get an opportunity, they should be using hand sanitizer or even washing their hands if they get to a place where they can do it. Um, along the way, people were also uh, providing free water and, and snacks and things to keep because it was a very hot day and people were getting dehydrated. So all those things, I think, meant, led to a very successful event. You do all that and stay safe and still get the message across. It seems like a good fit there, Dr. Barnard. Appreciate that. S well, stick I, around. No, go I, ahead. I, I have to. Yes. And, and I just want to say, Chuck, really quickly that I think people are starting to I think everybody is starting to realize that the, the behavior of police, while that's the focus of the current protests and, and rightly so, um, because there's a lot that can be done there. Um, but everyone is aware that the uh, inequities don't just begin and end with pol uh, police behavior. They also relate to the underlying conditions that we have been talking about over and over again, whether it's diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, and obesity. And so the role of a plant-based diet is getting lots and lots and lots of, of interest and attention from, peop from all pe people of all walks of life. We spoke uh, the other day about the, the conference that we had with Eric Adams from Brooklyn and Jonathan Nez uh, from the Navajo Nation and groups all coming together saying that it's time to reclaim your right 
to life and, and to good health, and that reclaiming your right to healthy food is an integral part of that. Dr. Barnard, looking forward to catching up with you in just a little bit. Again, if you have a question for Dr. Barnard or Dr. Greger, go ahead and post that in the comment section right now. We're going to be getting to that in just a little bit. But first, let's turn our attention to Dr. Greger's new book. He is, in fact, a multiple-time New York Times bestselling author, uh, founding member of the Fellow of American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and of course, one of the leading voices in the importance of plant-based nutrition, hot off the digital press, you see it right there on the screen, is his newest book, How to Survive a Pandemic. Dr. Michael Greger, so glad that you could join us here today. I am so honored to be back. All right. Well, let's start right off at the top, my friend. How does one survive the pandemic? What are the keys? Well, on how to survive a pandemic, I try to cover everything we need to know to protect ourselves and our family from the current pandemic threat, from optimal uh, respiratory hygiene and hand hygiene, surface disinfection, masks, how to make your own you know, hand sanitizer, on down the list. But the best way to survive a pandemic is to prevent it in the first place. And so actually the bulk of the book centers around tracing the origins of the coronavirus and what we can do to prevent even greater infectious disease threats in the future. I love the amount of research that you put into this thing because it, it dates back generations, centuries or more. And you're and you really did a very good job of pointing that this storm that we currently find ourselves in, this thing has been brewing for a long time. Oh, in fact, I mean, in fact, most of the major human diseases um, that afflict humanity can actually be traced back to our domestication of farm animals. For example, tuberculosis is thought to have been acquired through the domestication of goats. Measles, also from goats or sheep. Smallpox um, has been traced through the domestication of camels. We domesticated pigs and got whooping cough. We domesticated chickens and got typhoid fever and ducks and got influenza. Leprosy came from water buffalo, the common cold from cattle or horses. How often? Did uh, horses have the opportunity to sneeze into humanity's face until they're broken and bridled? Right until then, they were uh, the common cold was presumably only common to them. But he said, "Wait a second, we domesticated animals thousands of years ago. Why now? Over the last few decades, do we have hundreds of new pathogens emerging at a rate unprecedented in human history? Emerged from where? Mostly from animals. The AIDS virus." has been blamed on the bushmeat trade in Africa from the uh, butchering of primates. Uh, but mad cow disease was because we turned cows into you know, carnivores and cannibals. COVID-19 and SARS have been traced to the exotic wild animal trade. But, you know, the last pandemic, swine flu in 2009, uh, was not from some backwater wet market in Asia, but rather largely made in the USA on industrial pig operations here in the United States. Thankfully, swine flu only uh, killed about a half million people. But the next time, we might not be so lucky. There's a great quote in the book from Jay Leno. It says, where chicken soup used to cure the flu, now it gives you the flu. I mean, that's funny, but it does lead to a, a serious question, though. If all of these meat markets, these wet markets that we're talking about, both in China and then here domestically in the States, if all of them were to close what would the net effect be on our health worldwide? Well, I mean, I think closing uh, live animal markets go a long way towards preventing the next coronavirus pandemic. But according to the CDC, the leading candidate for the next pandemic is a bird flu virus known as H7N9, which is 100 times deadlier than COVID-19. Instead of 1 in 250 cases dying, H7N9 has killed... 40% of the people infected. So, you know, COVID-19 may just be a dress rehearsal uh, for an even greater threat waiting in the wings of chickens. Uh, the last time a bird flu virus jumped directly from, uh, from birds to humans, it triggered the deadliest plague in human history, the 1918 flu pandemic, which killed 50 million people. That had a 2% death rate. All right, what if we had a pandemic infecting billions where death was closer to a, a flip of a coin. But the good news is 
that there's something we can do about it. Again, just um, like, uh, you know, eliminating the exotic animal trade in live uh, animal markets may help prevent the next coronavirus. Reforming the way we raise domestic animals for food may help forestall the next killer flu. All right. And I think that the majority of people watching right now have one singular question on their mind. They're fans of yours. They're fans of Dr. Barnard. They want to read this new book, but they're probably wondering, well, if I start eating better, if I really adopt that plant-based diet, make no exceptions to it, how much protection will that offer me from not just this current pandemic, but future pandemics as well? Well, you know, uh, Dr. Barnard really nailed it on the head, right? Consider the underlying risk factors for COVID-19, uh, for severity and death, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes, all of which can be controlled or even reversed with a healthy enough plant-based diet and lifestyle. You know, excess body fat alone seems to be a risk factor independent of diabetes. So even, and it, you don't have to be obese, just being overweight can significantly increase your risk. Those with a body mass index or BMI of 28, which is like being 175 pounds at the average American height of five foot six, um, puts you at nearly six times the odds of suffering a severe course with COVID-19. That's BMI 28. The average BMI in the United States is 29. So even being skinnier than the average American, you could still have so much excess body fat puts you at significantly higher risk. So this is the time. We should take this opportunity to start cleaning up our diet. Yes, sufficient sleep. Yes, keeping active. Yes, reducing stress. Yes, uh, remaining connected, albeit remotely, to friends and family, right? Uh, but, um, but the most important thing we can do to protect ourselves is to eat a healthy diet. Now that's for the current pandemic. Um, for preventing the next pandemic, because the leading threat are these bird flu viruses, um, uh, then we really have to rethink how we are raising domestic animals for food. You know, when we, uh, you know, overcrowd thousands of animals, these cramped, filthy football field sized sheds like beak to beak or snout to snout atop their own waist, it's just a breeding ground uh, for disease. There's the sheer numbers of animals, uh, the, 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 the overcrowding, the, the stress crippling their immune system, the ammonia from the decomposing waste burning their lungs, lack of fresh air, lack of sunlight. You put all these factors together, and what you have is really kind of a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of these so-called super strains of influenza. The bottom line is that it's not worth risking the lives of millions of people for the sake of cheaper chicken. All right. Get your questions ready. Keep on posting them in the comment section already getting flooded. So make sure that you type yours in now. Dr. Greger, Dr. Barnard, you guys ready to open up the doctor's mailbag? You bet. All right, Dr. Greger, the first one comes to you. This is from Hogan. He's wondering if you could give an update on the role that vitamin D plays in reducing the risk for getting the coronavirus and other infections. There are certain nutrients like zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D that are critical for optimal immune function. But once you, ha once you have sufficient levels, there's no additional benefit uh, for immune function by adding extra on top of it. So we just need to have sufficient levels of nutrients. And where should we get them? Not the supplement aisle. We should get them in the produce aisle. Of course, vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, um, is acquired through uh, adequate sun exposure. Um, and this is the time to be getting outside, enjoying uh, this wonderful weather. Really, the greatest risk of transmission from um, the COVID-19 virus is confined, indoor, crowded spaces. Very few cases of transmission have been linked to outdoor transmission. So as long as you're social distancing, we should get out, uh, have fresh air, of course, continue to wear a mask um, um, and, 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 uh, and uh, sanitize or wash our hands before touching our mucous membranes. Um, our eyes, nose, and mouth after touching a public surface. But um, uh, one of the reasons it's uh, good to go outside is to get um, the vitamin D if for whatever reason you can't go outside. And there are certain very vulnerable populations, elderly, frail populations, those over the age 65, 70, we really need to continue um, to maintain um, those critical social distancing because there's such higher risk of, of disease and death or people that come in contact 
with um, older or frail people. And so for anyone who needs, for whatever reason, to stay inside over prolonged periods of time, then you could take a, you know, 2000 international units of vitamin um, a D a day. But again, it really comes down to just getting sufficient nutrition. And the way we do that is center our diets around the healthiest foods out there. And that's fruits, vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split pea, chickpea, and lentils, and whole grains, real food that grows out of the ground. These are our healthiest choices. Dr. Greger, our, my producer, Laura, just got my ear. She said, oh, my gosh, so many people are wondering, why isn't he on his treadmill today? Are you feeling okay? <laughs> um, I, yes, I'm not on my treadmill. I am, uh, I'm actually uh, quarantined um, in, uh, in California, uh, treadmill-less. Um, uh, so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so do as I say, not as I do and uh, go out and get some exercise. <laughs> All right. Uh, sticking with you. Next question is from DJ. If I eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, plus 50 to a hundred grams of fiber a day, does it really matter at that point if I choose to eat white rice instead of brown rice? Well, you know, people don't realize that there are nutrients, these important polyphenol phytonutrients that are actually complex to the fiber. Um, and so uh, the same question could be said for people that uh, drink, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, juice, fruits and vegetables or something. You're like, look, I'm eating a whole food plant based diet. I'm getting tons of fiber. Yes, when you juice fruits and vegetables, instead of blending them, you lose some of the fiber. But I, <laughs> fiber is the last thing I need. But they don't realize you're not just throwing away the fiber when you juice fruits and vegetables. So you're not just throwing the fiber when you when you uh, mill brown rice to white you lose cr other critical phytonutrients, actually complex of the fiber, and actually only release them to your body in the colon when your um, good bacteria eat the fiber, release the polyphenols, and then get absorbed into our bloodstream, circulate throughout our body, even get up into our brain. So many of the beneficial effects of fruits and vegetables and other whole healthy plant foods are actually attributed to these, uh, to these compounds that are complex to the fiber. And so when you throw out the fiber, when you mill away the fiber, um, when you juice away the fiber, you're not just throwing away the fiber, you're throwing away as much as 80% of those polyphenol phytonutrients. So it's always better to eat whole foods whenever possible. Dr. Barnard, this next one is for you. It comes to us from Odanya on YouTube. How do you deal with the rapid changes from the crisis and still stay mentally okay? Oh, I mean, how could people cope with all the stress that we're under? Uh, many people have, have talked about that. And I think First of all, nothing is going to make the world uh, a safe place 100%, and, and there is stress that we're going to have to live with. Um, nonetheless, there are certain things that we can do, um, a few basics. Uh, going to sleep is a good idea. Going to sleep, I, I personally have a rule. When the clock strikes 10, no matter how good the book is that I'm reading or the video that I'm watching or, now, or no matter how important the assignment is that I'm working on, I go to sleep. I'll pick it up the next morning. I make it up early if I need to. But if setting a time to go to bed that's reasonably early will make you much better balance during the day. Um, but if you lie down to sleep, you'll find your eyes just aren't closing because you've been working great like crazy. You might not have been getting any physical exercise. So as Dr. Greger was saying, it's good to get out and exercise because exercise makes your limbs and your body tired and tired muscles then demand sleep. Um, a healthy diet it is surprisingly helpful as well for anxiety and for sleep as well. Um, and we don't 100% know the reasons for this, but we did a research study with Geico, in 10, the, the car insurance company, in 10 different cities. And we used a plant-based diet to help people lose weight and improve diabetes. And along the way, we discovered that depression improved and anxiety improved. And other researchers have found the same kind of thing. What we think is happening is that the diet improves the gut bacteria, which feed back to the brain in, in, a, in a in kind of a two-way street. Um, but it also the diet is anti-inflammatory. So what am I saying? Um, we can't make all the stress go away. Getting a good night's sleep is important. Uh, many people, by the way, will also meditate or do yoga. Good idea. Uh, physical exercise is an anxiety producer uh, reducer in and of itself, and it helps you to sleep better. And a healthy diet will power all of those things forward too. So not a complete answer, but hopefully that'll be helpful. All right, Dr. Greg, we're putting the ball back in your court. We have time for just a couple more questions. This next one is from Ruth. She wants to know, Dr. Greger, how can I lower estrogen levels naturally? Well, that's uh, what fiber can do. Fiber can actually pull excess estrogen out of the body. 
Um, uh, and if you're, I, I, I have to dig a little deeper into this question. So for example, if you're concerned about breast cancer, um, uh, the, um, um, there are uh, a, a number of foods that have been associated with uh, significantly reduced breast cancer risk. So for example, soy foods, uh, particularly started uh, at a younger age, uh, are associated between 30 to uh, um, 50% lower breast cancer risk later in life. Um, and, uh, and, and then those with breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive or not, ontamoxifen or not, um, there's now been a half a dozen studies done with thousands of breast cancer survivors. And those who consume soy foods actually um, have reduced cancer recurrence rates and uh, live significantly longer, have lower um, um, uh, um, uh, cancer mortality as well. Um, so I uh, would encourage people to um, include soy foods in the diet. They have both uh, anti-estrogen effects where we want them in the breast, but pro-estrogenic effects where we want them, for example, um, increasing skeletal um, uh, bone strength and, uh, and uh, decreasing hot flash symptoms of menopause. Um, also, uh, ground flax seeds. I encourage people to go to nutritionfacts.org um, and you can pick your condition, whether you're concerned about menopausal symptoms or you're concerned about breast cancer risk, you just type it in nutritionfacts.org and all um, uh, the, the research will pop up. But of course, all I do is I, I pull all the research together. It's the amazing work of Dr. Um, uh, Neil Barnard, PCRM, that's actually done the studies. There'd be no videos on nutritionfacts.org. I deserve no credit other than just pulling together all the great research that's already been done. Um, and uh, that's why I'm so appreciative um, to uh, Dr. Barnard and PCRM for all the amazing work they do and looking forward to doing more videos based on any studies they have currently in the works. All right. And Dr. Barnard, this one comes to us from Pat on Facebook. Should I get a regular blood test while on a plant-based diet? If so, what should I be looking out for? Okay. Uh, by the way, let me uh, let me add on to what uh, Dr. Gregor was just mentioning about getting away from estrogens. Uh, he's he's absolutely right. Boosting fiber helps. One other thing: skip cheese. Surpri sounds surprising, but dairy products have estrogens in them that come from cows. We used to think that the traces were really unimportant, uh, but we now do think that that uh, it's enough to actually affect reproductive function and probably cancer risk too. Okay. So getting bl a blood test. Um, it's all, I'm guessing the questioner didn't say which particular blood test she's thinking about. But when you go see your doctor, um, your doctor will be, if the doctor is not too clued in about diet um, and you say you're following a vegan diet, you're probably well-meaning but ill-informed doctor might start worrying about protein and things. That's actually the last thing you need to worry about. You are almost certainly getting more than, more than enough protein. Uh, but there are some things that I think are worth looking at. Um, many doctors nowadays are rightly looking at vitamin D levels in patients. Um, just to make sure that they're adequate. For many people, they're low. And then you need Dr. Greger's advice, which is get out, get some sunlight. And if you can't get sunlight, then a supplement makes sense. So a vitamin D test is not a bad idea. Um, it's good to get your cholesterol tested, especially if you're not on a plant-based diet, because those rising numbers will motivate you to get on a plant-based diet. The number you wanna look at is especially your LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein or bad cholesterol. If it's above 100, good time to start a vegan diet. And whatever it is, it's a good time to start a plant-based diet. Those are a few. Um, some people will look at their B12 levels, but the fact of the matter is that if you're on a plant-based diet, you, you really need to be supplementing vitamin B12, which kind of takes the testing, um, may, makes it less urgent. So I hope those are a few uh, helpful observations. All right, Dr. Barnard, and the final question is with you. This one from Sandy. Can you comment on nuts? Is there a recommended maximum? Um, there, there's No, there, there isn't a recommended maximum, but, but I do have a rule of thumb. And it's based on the idea that nuts are healthful in many ways. Um, they've got lots of healthy compounds in them, but they also are really fatty. And they can be a bit addicting. So you take those smokehouse almonds and pour them into your hand and, you know, 17 handfuls later, you realize, gee, I think I might have overdone it. Um, you're getting a lot of fat and a lot of calories. So my recommendation is an ounce a day. Um, and an ounce a day is if you pour them into your hand, once it hits your fingers, um, that's when it's more than an ounce. But if it's just in your palm, that's about an ounce. And then don't eat it. Crumble it up and put it on your cereal or, or uh, on your salad or something like that. So if you use them as an ingredient, you're not going to refill your hand and, and uh, overdo it the way you would if it was a snack food. So that'll get you going. If you are trying to lose weight, if you're trying to reverse diabetes, my suggestion 
set the nuts aside for now. All right, that's all the time we have for the mailbag today, but keep your questions coming in because Dr. Barnard, you're gonna be right back here on Monday. We're gonna answer a couple of more, so keep posting them in the comment section or you can tweet them to us at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room podcast. You can also find us on Facebook, obviously, and Instagram all over the place. Just make sure that you keep those questions coming. Dr. Barnard, while I still have you here, uh, I should point out that Dr. Greger is one of our featured speakers coming up at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, August 6th through 8th. The first time this event is going to be completely online. I know that you have to be excited about this. I mean, there's just so many speakers, Dr. Greger, yourself, who are going to be dropping a whole lot of nutrition nuggets out there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Greger is going to be there. He's going to be a featured speaker. People are going to love it. Um, and we have many other wonderful speakers there too. Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard uh, will be there in a huge line of, of just all-stars. And because it's a, a virtual session this time, we've got many, many people thinking, I can join from Europe. I can join from the West Coast without, you know, in the past, it's always been live and in person. So this is really opening the door toward much wider participation than we have ever had. Much as we like to see people live and in person, this, the virtual event is gonna be maybe our best ever. So it's the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine for doctors, nurses, dietitians, PAs, Join us, get, uh, I think it's 20 hours of continuing education. And uh, Natalie Hardcastle and Jill Eckert and the whole team here pulled together a bang up great conference. And we're going to have a lot of those uh, speakers. They're going to be on the exam room here, both on the podcast and here on the live show coming up in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. And also, if you're not busy right now and you say, well, my goodness, that sounds like something I want to go to. That sounds like something I want to spend some time with. Well, head over to PCRM.org slash ICNM. And that is where you can register for that right this very second, my friend. And also don't forget to pick up a copy of Dr. Greger's new book, How to Survive a Pandemic that is out right now as an ebook and an audio book, already a bestseller on Amazon. And we've posted a link to that in the comments section or just head over to Amazon right now to get your copy. And while we're just talking about everything, make sure that you schedule an appointment to visit one of our plant-based doctors and nutritionists over at the Barnard Medical Center. You can do that right now as well. Everyone there really truly puts a premium on nutrition and can take a very close look at your diet. Kind of get in there and fine tune things. You guys had so many great questions today. Well, this making an appointment to speak with our doctors and our dietitians that would be a great opportunity for you to dive even deeper on some things, really get you on the path toward a healthier life. And just like ICNM this year is online, well, you can have these appointments online as well with telemedicine. New patients being accepted right now across the country. You see the web address right there on your screen right now, barnardmedical.org, or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500 to schedule your appointment. That list of states, California, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Kentucky. We can get you so much help there. So barnardmedical.org, 202-527-7500. And again, you don't even have to get off of your couch. You can do this right from the comfort of your own home. This, my friend, is the modern day doctor's house call. It is phenomenal. My wife uses it. She swears by it. It is the greatest thing since sliced whole wheat bread. Uh, so... Uh, thank you guys so very much for taking some time to spend with us today. And before we go, I really I wanted to put a spotlight on someone who's just so inspirational. You know, we want to take some time to encourage everyone to keep learning about health disparities and about racism and to take a stand. This is so important. And so one great way that you can do that is by shining a spotlight on those who are currently speaking out, leaders in this community, sharing some important information. And today, I want to tell you about Karen Eubanks Jackson. She is a four-time breast cancer survivor and the founder of the Sisters Network. Now, when Karen was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 1994, she looked around and she realized there was virtually no support for women of color. So what did she do? she founded what would become the nation's only breast cancer survivor network for African-American women. And today they are still going strong, still sharing a powerful message of surviving, of thriving, and educating. And so Karen Eubanks-Jackson, you are an inspiration to millions. 
Check them out online right now at sistersnetworkinc.org. And then Monday, back here on Facebook and YouTube, noon Eastern, for the exam room live, we're going to be taking a look probably at the new dietary guidelines. There's going to be some movement on that in the very near future. So come back here Monday, noon Eastern. Dr. Barnard and I are going to be dishing on the dietary guidelines right here on the exam room live. My thanks to everyone who helped make today's show possible, producers Laura Anderson and our director Donna Steele and Emily Cologne working behind the scenes as well could not have done this without you. For Drs. Barnard and Gregor and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and remember, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based. Talk to you all Monday.